There were various points of despair that nobody saw happening that were bubbling beneath the surface. Everything on the surface probably seemed like it was doing okay, but there were deep fissures that weren't being addressed, obviously about matters of race and socioeconomic class. I think that it was just a widening gap between our economy looked like it was doing pretty well, things looked like they were pretty stable. On one hand, a lot of unhappy people. And I think we've seen those divisions were very easily manipulated. President Trump is a figurehead of a particular movement income inequality, about lower income white populations in the Midwest and South, dying country like ours to have a shortening life expectancy for a demographic group and particularly a mainstream demographic group. It was very easy for someone to tap into that unhappiness and divide us apart. I think the hard work of working back from this is going to be not just to win an election or change administration. That part seems almost the more straightforward part, but it's really how do we heal the divide? Whose responsibility is it to do the healing? So I'll put myself out there. Working class black guy from the North. None of this was a surprise to me. One of the things I've repeatedly argued in print and elsewhere is the dominant narrative of the quote-unquote white working class angst. The empirical data tells us it was racism, not class angst. But how can you separate the two? They love to send the intrepid reporters out to Trump Landia to do these profiles about the quote-unquote toothless hillbillies. So all the stereotypes there. And it seems like they want to have all this empathy and sympathy. Here's another moment. Think about the opioid epidemic. When you have Chris Christie on 60 Minutes a few years ago crying about white folks, one of his friends who's a drug addict, where's that empathy or sympathy for black and brown folks or folks out there on the res, you know? No right answer to that. I mean, I think that people understandably or irrationally right now traumatized. I think that there's a massive empathy void in our country. And I think people have stopped really listening to each other across the board. And I realize that might sound a bit kumbaya, but that's actually not what I mean. In a way, the ways that we engage with each other are forums that are designed to foment conflict amongst ourselves. And so we tweet at each other, Fox News and other network. I just think that people have really stopped not just listening to each other, but they actually don't even know the talking points to be empathic in a way. It's not just who's going to reach out first. It's really like, what would it mean to know enough about somebody else's concern to actually address problems that they're feeling? I went, I spent seven or eight years talking to people that I didn't really agree with. And what I found was, to me, pretty surprising, which was that these were probably people who I would have been fighting with on Twitter. And when I started talking to people in probably the most, it wasn't, as you say, toothless hillbillies, but it was very strongly pro-gun, pro-Trump, red state America, which is in part where I'm from. It wasn't totally foreign to me. I found again and again that people who I would automatically have disagreed with the minute we started kind of talking, and maybe it was easier because I'm white and they're white, but I would say even issues that we were supposed to disagree about, guns or the NRA or Obamacare, factors like that, it did seem like having a conversation where I was actually listening to what people said changed the way that I not just understood what they were asking, but actually listened to them. Trump's victory did not surprise me because I grew up with a lot of these folks. But I got to say, my empathy level, my empathy well, my empathy tank is pretty low right now. You folks, you did this. You did this to this country. And you need to be held accountable. And I really don't feel much empathy or sympathy for you. I mean, so help me make this a teachable moment, if you would. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, empathy is one of the issues that, that's been taken up since really the aftermath of the 2016 election. So right after the election, there were people like Michael Lerner writing about empathy. If you read Hostile's great book, Strangers in Their Own Land, that's a call for empathy in a particular way. I argue in Dying of Whiteness that I think we need to look at this first and foremost as a policy issue, right? That in a way, if we're trying to change people's identities or their attitudes or their sympathies, I just think that the divisions are so deep that it's not going to get us. Maybe it will in some particular instances. But I think so many of the issues that I look at in the book, I mean, I look at rising rates of gun death. I look at despair from not having health care and health insurance. I look at tax cuts in states like Kansas that eviscerated funding for roads and bridges and schools. And certainly those led to a number of things, including divisiveness. I mean, I could tell you stories for the next eight hours about how having more guns around makes people less empathic and less empathic and probably more racist in certain kind of ways. But I will say that all of these divisions for me ended up being the result of particular moments where particular policies were made. We made it way too easy for people to get guns. We block expansion of government health care or, or the Affordable Care Act without having any viable 
backup plan for how people were going to get health care. In a way, what I really focus on is I think if we can create empathic policies, policies that people can see themselves in, I feel like if we fix the policies that the empathy question will largely start to fix itself. Certainly, there's a lot of racial animosity, racial resentment. I title the book that because that's a fact. But I would also say that one of my main findings in the book was I was looking, obviously, at the white working class in the Midwest and South, and some people were racist and some people weren't racist, and some people were willing to talk to me about it and some people weren't. They were all suffering negative health effects, not because of their individual attitudes, but because of the policies that had failed them. And how do we reconcile that sort of very hopeful vision with the reality? The American electorate is relatively unsophisticated. Um, and this idea that you'd have these white voters making decisions based on policy. The historical record is pretty clear in this country that racism hurts white people. But we can give them all these policies. We can say, okay, let's treat you as rational voters, as rational actors. But then how does that overcome symbolic power whiteness or this emotional investment in whiteness? Because that's what we're seeing right now, right? Consistently, these white voters support policies that hurt them. I did develop a sense that people were making decisions, for better or worse, based on the stressors or material realities of their own lives. And so completely agree with you that there are structural problems with the ways that whiteness is defined and implemented, particularly in lower and kind of middle income, not exclusively white working populations in this country. In other words, there's this idea, you can just imagine this hierarchy that I'm on top of this pyramid because I have this particular racial identity and people below me are trying to usurp my resources. People are trying to take things from me. And that is just an incredibly pathological structure. And I can quote again, research for the rest of the day about how multicultural and more equitable societies have better health outcomes for everybody. I can quote research that talks about how if you actually fix problems of equity that everybody's health gets better. States that have, for example, functioning healthcare systems, everybody's health gets better. Certainly, I agree with you that I think that part of the book argues that there's a kind of pathological construction of whiteness that's honestly not doing anybody any favors. And we've been living with this thing for two centuries now, and it's time to really start to think more openly and honestly about more overt and more honest conversations about whiteness, how really white Americans are being hurt by not having a more developed rhetoric for talking not just about whiteness as power or strength, but also talking about whiteness as vulnerability. I'll give you one example of that. All the rhetoric for guns is about, you know, white patriots and white defenders and to use LaPierre's language, defending against gangbangers and carjackers. And there's this incredible racial anxiety about whites being impinged on or carjacked by minorities. And that's really one of the main drivers of the rhetoric of NRA ads and things like that. And the other time we talk about guns are around mass shootings. But then if you look at actually who are the victims of most gun death in this country, you know, we have about 40,000 gun deaths a year in this country. About two thirds of those are gun suicide and upwards of 80 something percent of those suicides are white men. So ironically, white men are the main people who are dying of gun death in this country, but there's no rhetoric about it because it abuts this idea of whiteness as being powerful. What does whiteness mean for the folks you interviewed? I want to be very clear in the book that I'm not talking about whiteness as a biological category. I'm, I mean, there are different modes of whiteness across the country. I was really looking at people who, and talking to people who espoused what Frank calls backlash conservative whiteness across the South and the Midwest, this kind of sense that whiteness is a privileged position that is under attack by the government or immigrants or minorities. It's something that needed to be defended. And it was, you know, you can read that in a book, but actually talking to people who are really living that is quite a powerful experience experience. I talked to people who were literally on death's doorstep in low-income housing communities and medical clinics who were not getting health care because Tennessee didn't adopt the Affordable Care Act. The one thing they were holding on to was that at least their tax dollars weren't going to what they said were Mexicans and, and welfare queens. This idea of whiteness was something that was so powerful in relation to other groups that were trying to usurp what people had. People literally were almost going to their graves holding on to it. 